Hello, and thanks for checking out this TI Precision Lab on the CAN physical layer and hardware. This lab will discuss the electrical transmission characteristics, also known as the physical layer, of the controller area network standard, and the hardware associated with the implementation of the standard. The term physical layer refers to the transmission of raw bits across a network, or the lowest layer of computer networking. We have mentioned that CAN uses a two-wire differential interface. These wires are CAN H and CAN L, and the difference in voltage between these two wires is called VD. To transmit a logic zero, the CAN H and CAN L pins are simultaneously pulled high and low, respectively. This brings the differential voltage, VD, to above 0.9 volts, which is referred to as a dominant state. To transmit a logic 1, the pins are released by the driver, and VD dissipates across the termination resistors. This brings CAN H and CAN L back to VCM, the common mode voltage, and reduces VD to below 0.5 volts, which is referred to as a recessive state. So once again, a logic 0 is a dominant state, meaning a differential voltage above 0.9 volts, while a logic 1 is a recessive state, meaning a differential voltage below 0.5 volts. Take a look at the rising and falling edges of the red and blue CAN lines shown in the middle of the screen. Notice that the transitions to dominant are sharp, while the transitions to recessive are much less sharp. This is because CAN driver topology allows CAN drivers to drive the CAN H line high and the CAN L line low, but it does not allow them to drive the lines back toward VCM. Instead, the bus returns to a recessive state from a dominant state via passive dissipation across the termination resistors. This is why a logic 0 is called a dominant state and a logic 1 is called a recessive state. If any single device on the bus transmits a dominant signal, it will always override a simultaneous recessive signal sent from another device. If devices on the same bus were allowed to drive both dominant and recessive signals, it could allow situations where competing devices cause shorting between different power rails. CAN uses this characteristic to ensure that higher priority messages are transmitted without signal destruction. Each CAN bit is divided into the four segments shown here, with a sample point typically located at the 75% point of a bit width. The first segment, called the synchronization segment, is the time that a recessive to dominant transition is expected to occur. All the nodes on a bus synchronize on rising edges. The second segment, the propagation time segment, is designed to compensate for the physical delay times of the network. The third and fourth segments, both phase buffer segments, are used for resynchronization. The bit value is sampled by the receiver immediately following phase segment one. Pictured here is a typical setup for a CAN network. Notice the twisted pair cabling used in this setup. As mentioned in our Introduction and Overview Precision Lab, communication occurs over a differential bus at up to 1 megabit per second for classical CAN and up to 5 megabits per second for CAN with flexible data rate, or CAN FD. The maximum operating rate of a particular CAN network, however, depends on several factors. Shown here in the red oval is the CAN bus cable length. The propagation time over this cable is one of the greatest driving factors that limit maximum operating rate of the network. A longer cable means a longer propagation time over the bus, typically having a trade-off of 5 nanoseconds per meter. Other considerations include the delay introduced by any isolation in the system, shown here in green, and transceiver-induced delay. Controller I.O. delay, though present, is typically negligible in this environment. The total round-trip delay of the system is two times the total delay induced by these components. Since bus length is frequently the driving figure, we can determine a general trade-off between bus length and maximum signaling rate, which begin to have an inverse relationship with each other after bus length exceeds 40 meters. 
Reducing one factor, such as transceiver delay, allows a greater budget for other types of delay, including a longer cable length. In our TI Precision Lab titled CAN Protocol and CAN FD, we review the concept of arbitration. Arbitration is the key to a CAN network, so knowing the loop and round trip delay is critical to determining a proper sampling point. Otherwise, the faster node may sample the bus before the slower node bit state transmission. Specific parameters related to timing and synchronization can be set up in the CAN controller to accommodate propagation delays. Here is the 8-pin CAN and CAN FD standard pinout. The TXD, RXD, CAN H, and CAN L pins, along with VCC and ground, are present on all 8-pin transceivers. Pins 5 and 8 can be used for some additional transceiver features. Many transceivers implement low power modes, implemented using pin 8 on the device, the most common of which are standby mode, silent mode, and sleep mode. Pin 5 can have one of a few features, or can be a no connect. The VIO pin provides a separate supply voltage for the transceiver IO pins TXD and RXD. The less common split pin provides a VCC over 2 output to stabilize the bus common mode voltage for applications using split termination. Fault is even less common than split on 8-pin transceivers. Here is an example of a typical CAN node configuration for a car. Each node in the network has a processor, like this TMS570, that interfaces with a transceiver, like this TCAN1042. The transceiver interfaces with the CAN or CAN FD bus. Many microprocessors and transceivers communicate with each other over TXD and RXD via a CAN controller within the processor. There are also optional external components that some systems might have, including split termination, diodes for additional ESD or transient protection on the CAN bus lines, common mode bus stabilization output, or external pull-up resistors to accommodate for MCUs that need them for fast data rates. 14-pin CAN transceivers keep the same base functionality as the 8-pin transceivers, but add several additional functions, such as the ability to use low power modes to enable battery-powered operation and to signal the rest of the system to start up based on wake-up commands issued via the CAN bus. Fault pins issue fault signals when a dominant timeout occurs at the receiver. Notice that the 14-pin transceivers feature the same pin mapping as the 8-pin devices. This allows 8-pin devices to be easy drop-in replacements for 14-pin devices in application. Here is a typical application for a 14-pin CAN transceiver. We can see that the same basic circuitry as the 8-pin application is featured here, but there is additional interfacing for enable, fault, wake, supply voltage, and inhibit. In normal operation, CAN and CAN FD transceivers consume some amount of supply current, which allows the driver and receiver to operate. The SN65HVD23X series typically consumes 6 milliamps of supply current, for example. Like many transceivers, however, this device series features standby and sleep modes, controlled via pin 8. When a device is placed into standby mode, the receiver remains active and behaves as a slave to the bus. The driver, however, is turned off. In this listen-only state, the transceiver is completely passive to the bus. During sleep mode, both the driver and the receiver are switched off. In this ultra-low power mode, the bus pins are in a high impedance state, while the TXD and RXD pins default to logic high. The device remains in standby or sleep mode until the processor deactivates this mode via pin 8. To find more CAN and CAN FD technical resources, and to search for CAN and CAN FD products, visit ti.com slash CAN. Also, be sure to check out our other TI Precision Labs videos for controller area network. Thank you for watching.